Okay, we could still chat uh, uh, to wait. Uh, so how's the weather, I mean, in Boston? I think it's been similarly weird. Uh, warm some days, wet, snowy. I think if it hadn't been so warm, we would have several feet of snow this year, but not any at all so far. Okay. So. Wow. Yeah. You know, I kind of fear you know, the, the climate crisis is near. And you know what? I actually uh, visited Boston the other day, uh, the, in November, actually, to give a bunch of different talks to, I mean, different university at that time, also uh, attending the conference. Oh my God, you know, in November in Boston, I literally kind of walked from Boston University to Harvard University after my talk in at the you know Boston University. And I don't want to just take the tea or whatever. The metro system is crazy. I mean, over there, the green line especially. But mm -hmm. I just literally walk because the weather is so beautiful. I mean, out there, I mean the sunny and then very warm. And then I just decided to just walk. I mean, sorry, me. And that's the best strolling. I mean, this that last year, I mean, I ever had. I mean, so very yeah. weird. I mean. Yeah, Boston's a relatively small city, as you know. You can get pretty far by walking <laughs> uh, in a fairly short amount of time. But when I was student and postdoc over there, I never imagined kind of walking from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. I always kind of use my you know car. But oh my God, that day, I mean, I, I, I cannot even imagine you know, just taking the subway because the I mean, weather was so beautiful. The entire the week, I mean, basically the weather was so great. I mean, in, win in win November in Boston, yeah. I never imagined. It's unusual. <laughs> I, in a whole, I mean, the early, I mean, the, the Colorado, I mean, the, because of fire and then and the snow after war, the, the snow basically help, you know, extinguishing yeah. whatever, you know, fire problem at the time, right? And we just got a couple inches last night, uh, but it gets so warm in Denver periodically that it doesn't build up much in the city, but we're getting loads of snow up in the mountains. So it's actually kind of nice. You don't have to shovel as much, but then a two hour drive, you're skiing in a couple feet of snow. Okay. And then you, this is your house? right yeah. now mm -hmm. this is beautiful i mean you have very nice you know flowers <laughs> They're fake flowers. this is the basement but uh a basement <laughs> your basement is much better than my you know the living room actually <laughs> <laughs> well, okay so i oh, go ahead just their dried flowers i guess i should shouldn't cut them short they were a gift from a friend okay great all right i guess we probably want to start so, okay. So, good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo. Hello, all. Welcome and thank you for joining us, the 15th seminar in Nature Chemical Biology Day 2 and the first symbiosis meeting in 2022. I was so excited. And of course, Happy New Year to everybody. And I hope you have enjoyed holidays and you are still keeping your New Year resolution. I have enjoyed unbelievably warm St. Louis winter break near 60 and up to 70 Fahrenheit for a week or longer although we will have single digit today with snow covered load and already. I guess, I mean, the first real snow this winter and a little bit, of course, I mean, unusual and freezing right now uh, or climate crisis. Okay, it's my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Dr. Terry Shepard. I would not need any introduction of him, but he's uh, the editor in chief of Nature Chemical Biology. Also, he's the second pioneer who joins 
us from the same journal after Dr. Caitlin Dean last September. So I'm so grateful for Nature Chem Bio support for this seminar series. Also, uh, Dr. Terry Shepard, you know, basically said he will stay even after this one hour session for the separate Zoom. So if you want to ask any question about journal editing or, you know, publishing, please, I mean, you know, join us for the another Zoom meeting. So Terry, I mean, the virtual force is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tezuk. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be we with everyone. And uh, I really appreciate your efforts in organizing this virtual seminar series. I, I think in these strange times, it's really critical that we continue the scientific conversation. And, you know, these types of forums uh, are really, really useful in doing that. And um, I also really like the format that you've chosen because it gives us more senior people very little time and it places the emphasis on the most exciting research that's going on in the community in synthetic biology. So I, I think that's a great way to do it. And finally, I mean, I've organized things before and I know how much time and effort this takes. So thank you. And we all really appreciate what, you, what you're doing here. So thank you. Um, so I just, I put together a few comments um, that are a bit historical and perspective, uh, I guess, on the field. Um, I've been the chief editor of Nature Chemical Biology since it started in 2005. And before that, I was a chemical biologist myself. Uh, I trained as a bioorganic chemist, uh, and then I did a postdoc more in the molecular biology space and had an independent program focused on nucleic acid chemical biology. And um, at that time in the, in the early 2000s, there weren't many for, forums to publish interdisciplinary research. There was really only one or two chemical biology journals to speak of. And so when I heard that Nature was interested in doing such a journal, I really jumped at the chance and I feel I've found my calling in, in some regards. Um, and I think what's been most exciting about it, uh, about this opportunity, is that it allowed us to develop a journal for a field that is developing and evolving in time, in real time. And it's very exciting. And the challenge to identify papers that really reflect the diversity of chemical biology research is, is really exciting and humbling in, in, in most respects. Um, the, the job of the editor is actually quite an exciting one because every day you see something new, you're always learning, you uh, find out about that new technique that's coming down the pipe and also the cool new hypotheses that are governing different facets of the field. And I think you know the greatest uh, part of the job for me is, is working and engaging with a really diverse group of scientists from around the world who make these discoveries and make it all happen in communicating the results to the, to the community. So it's really been an exciting uh, time and we, we celebrate our 17th anniversary this next summer. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so having been doing this for a while, I've, I've been witness to the evolution of chemical biology and synthetic biology really in parallel during my career. And I've always considered these two fields to be kindred spirits because they, they approach problems in very similar ways and their, their way of thinking about the solutions is quite similar. And so I just wanted to make a few comments about that. Um, chemical biology, which I would say really came together in the 1990s started as a field that was very much focused on small molecules and chemical tools that were designed to understand biological systems, right? And then since then, it has really expanded to include a lot of different chemical biologists or chemists and biologists and engineers of various stripes. And they've taken a much broader view of both the research problems that they're focused on, but also in bringing together the tools and thinking of different disciplines chemistry, biology, engineering, computational science, mathematics. And for a chemical biologist, the main motivation is often 
what can I do to understand mechanism and biology better, right? That's, that's one of the fundamental principles that chemical biologists bring to the table. But from my point of view, chemical biologists have always had a restless streak. That is, it's not good enough to just understand uh, how biology works. You want to use that knowledge to make new things, build new non-natural systems that have practical applications or medical applications. And that's really been a thread that started in chemical biology way back since bioorganic chemistry in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it's this particular thread, I think, where synthetic biology and chemical biology really overlap. And if you think about the Venn diagram between those two fields, if they were at first just touching, now they're starting to really overlap in some key ways. Um, and I think about fields like metabolic engineering, right, which we'll hear some about today, uh, small molecule tools, protein engineering, biosensing, expanding the genetic code, regulatory networks and gene circuits, and CRISPR, of course, these days, um, designing synthetic signaling systems that could be useful in things like CAR-T systems and so on. And all of these problems are things that both chemists, uh, chemical biologists and synthetic biologists work on. And I really do believe that, that working together more in the future on these problems will really accelerate discovery in this field and also the practical applications that, uh, that uh, they promise to science and to society. Um, and then finally, I, I think there's a lot that the two fields can, can learn from each other. Um, even though they've kind of pursued parallel tracks in many areas over the years, um, I think that the chemical perspective that chemical biologists bring to the table and the emphasis that they put on molecular understanding and mechanism and characterization of systems at the molecular level, I think is really useful when synthetic biologists think about design and iterating systems to make them better or more efficient or more practically useful in cells or organisms. Synthetic biology in turn, I think is really a, a very practical engineering perspective on things that there's a defined goal and we set out to achieve that goal through the technology and the approach that we use. And I think that's a, that practicality is a real value of the synthetic biology community. And the other thing I've always admired about synthetic biology is the openness of the culture. They've always had this open science perspective where data and reagents are shared uh, and, and various conferences that everyone is aware of to present their new new parts and, and uh, pieces, I think it's fantastic. And this is a, a thing that broader science could learn from more and more um, as, as the years go on, is sharing data and facilitating the conversation to advance knowledge and practical insights down the road. So even after all these years, I, I feel even more excited about chemical biology and synthetic biology and the potential that these fields bring to science generally, but also the things that are gonna come in the future as far as applications in medicine and, and, and uh, addressing things like the climate crisis and so on. So um, from my seat as an editor, I'm just especially looking forward to witnessing this evolution and, and interacting with all the creative scientists and, and uh, seeing, seeing what results. So that's all I have to, to say today. Thank you very much. Oh my God, wow, thank you so much for your amazing talk and inspiring insight with the history. You know, I was trained as an applied chemist during my BS program, but I am doing synthetic biology right now. And then I did actually even didn't take the, you know, advanced kind of biology course when I was high school student. So I completely agree with you regarding interdisciplinary research and its importance. And also, I also believe I met you for the first time at the, one of the synthetic biology Gordon conferences, I believe. So of course, I mean, I guess, I mean, the joy of being editors is reading exciting papers, but the worst part is to reject papers, right? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> th there's so much good work that comes in the door, right? And, and we, you know, 
nature journals at least only publish about 10% of what are submitted and about a third of what gets submitted gets reviewed. So it's, it's a very, uh, we spend a lot of time rejecting good papers and it's difficult. It's really sure, difficult. sure, sure. Now uh, we will hear, I mean, more after you know, this session, I mean, during the separate session, I mean, we, we want to kind of ask more questions. Okay, 